Welcome to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast, where we meet experts from all walks of life to learn their intrinsic motivation so that they can share it with the world. What do we have in store today? Stay tuned to find out more. I don't know. This is good. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there. When you listen to this podcast, this is Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. I am Hamza. And I am David. And today, everyone is in for a treat. For those that have listened for some time, this is episode 33. And when we first started our first podcast, we always talk about our hello moment or what what got us started. And the guest we have today was actually very instrumental in my path. Before meeting uh, Jim Self, I actually did a lot of book knowledge stuff. But I went to his introductory weekend back in 2009, and from that I met Joanne and um, Horizon Center for Intuitive Awareness, and things have been great ever since. And Jim was very instrumental for that. So you guys are in for a treat. We have Jim Self on the podcast today. Welcome, Jim. Very nice to be here, Amza and David. Good. Thank you for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Now, Jim, you, uh, you and David know each other and from the psychic or the uh, Berkeley Psychic Horizons Institute back in the days. So if you could tell a little bit about your, how you got started and what brings and bring us current. Sure. My start actually was actually long before that. You know, when people come into a body born, they come in really pretty fully loaded. That soft spot on the top of the head is the place where they don't leave home. They're still connected to that spiritual aspect of who they are. And then as they begin to get a little older, that spot goes away, hardens up. You know, it's like if you look in the eyes of a little baby, you just see forever. And then six months later, it's a little duller and they're a little bit more here in in the this world, not where they were, where they were completed. And over time, that, that those abilities, which are very available to them, in a way get talked out of them. And so, you know, the mom, dad, teacher, minister of life basically say, here's the truth. This is right. This is wrong. Good, bad, should, shouldn't. You talk to these. You don't talk to those. You go to this school, etc. And in that process of acclimating into this third dimensional experience, most everybody turns off all of their spiritual abilities or some call them psychic abilities and um, or they stop paying attention to them and they pretty much don't recognize how to use them. In my case, for whatever reason, I didn't really turn off those abilities growing up and um, it was a little bit odd at different times and I just assumed everybody did what I did and kind of went through life and then in uh, the time where I really kind of met David, it was a period of time that was uh, an odd awakening because um, I was, uh, let's see, I guess I was about almost 30 and on the San Jose, California City Council, which was an interesting experience, San Jose being the fastest growing city in the country for 10 consecutive years. And in the process of that being, uh, be playing where I was playing, I started to begin to turn on even more. And it was in that experience that I found something called the Berkeley Psychic Institute, which was in San Jose as well as Berkeley, California. And I would sit down with these people and they would do what I did. And it was really one of the first times that people actually did what I did and I could understand that's what they did. And um, in the course of all that work, I spent about 14 years there, both studying and teaching pretty much everything. And that's where David and I kind of met. And Joanne, uh, David's mom, and I were together all the time doing different um, different readings and different teachings. So that's kind of where that background comes from. Wow. So what, what year was that when you first came, Jim? Do you remember when you first walked through those doors? Yeah, what it, it had to be um, it had to be in about ni- late 1978. 
Oh, okay. So you actually, you're, I think you're a few years before Joanne. Then I, I don't think she started hanging around there until about eighty, eighty one. Yeah, I could, could be. Oh, well, that could be. That could be. Um, yeah. But because I left, I left and went and took a job uh, with the uh, um, as an advisor to President Jimmy Carter and the director of governmental operations for the Department of Energy. And then when Carter was unelected, I was wonderfully unappointed and was really free and went back to San Jose. And actually, that might make sense. That's when Joanne and I started um, engaging with each other for the remainder of the 80s and and into the early 90s. Okay, yeah, because it seems seems like my recollection was – once I started kind of hanging out there, you were, yeah, you were already a teacher and teaching and, and yes, what. Yes, yep. Yeah, so I remember doing some of your workshops and stuff. So, all right, great. So since that was the first time being amongst your ilk, if you will, at, were, did you make it a point to, I'm, I'm thinking because out loud, because we had uh, interviewed Mary Bell a few weeks ago, and she had mentioned her time in Florida and how she wound up in California and ultimately in, in, in Colorado. And it was to be around like-minded people. And you actually kind of felt, did you feel like you met your family there at the Psychic Institute? And, and did you keep up relationships over the years? Well, we've kept up relationships. But oddly enough, I, I can't say I felt like it was family. And this is one of the things that we bump into in uh, in Mastering Alchemy, we can talk about in a few minutes, in the Level 1 program. One of the things that happen when people start to turn on, they get very excited and they f- begin to start to construct reality based on what they know, not what's available. And so... The people that were at the Berkeley Psychic Institute really in those early days um, was a great cadre of everything. Uh, Shy people, people who were hiders, people who were uh, obnoxious, people who were authoritarian, people who absolutely knew what they were doing, they thought, all kinds of people. And so Berkeley Psychic Institute wasn't necessarily a community. It was a gathering, and it was a gathering in such a way that the, the people who were running it, uh, Louis Boswick, Michael Tamora, John Fulton, really, really great teachers, basically, they kind of said, here's how this works, and they taught these reading skills. And in the process of beginning to look at reading in the context that we all taught, you basically ask the question, you know, what is this person all about? And they would, in their energy field, show you. And what you got to look at in both the people who were your co-creators as well as people that came in the door is you got to look at people's pain, their frustration, their lies, their truths, all of their belief systems, much of which was the unconsciousness that they have raised up with one of the things we talk about in Mastering Alchemy a lot is people simply say hello to you in odd ways. They say, you're not attractive. You're not successful. What's wrong with you? You're not very smart. And what happens in that context is it's as if somebody hands you a gift and we get knocked out of our space and we kind of accept it. And then we do one of the worst things we can possibly do is we say, What did I do wrong? What's wrong with me? Well, really, the gift of you're not okay, you're not attractive, you're not smart, is really somebody else's bad day as they're hanging out with you. (laughs) And and very seldom that statement that they throw at you, hand to you, put in your space, really has nothing to do with you virtually at all. They're watching you do something, and from their truth – your truth doesn't matter. And so think about it as a young kid starting to explore, trying to figure it out itself. It clearly steps into places it shouldn't be, and then it goes oops and backs out. But if you happen to be in the oops when an adult sees you and says, you're stupid, you're never going to succeed, and they throw that into your space, 
you begin to get very hesitant about engaging in life, trying things out, exploring new opportunities, having excitement, because you're now saddled with this gift that says you're not okay. And then what we do is we walk around for the rest of their lives, her lives, and say, what did I do wrong? I'm not okay. I don't fit. I'm never going to succeed. And we begin to believe the story that was really somebody else's bad moment. And so in the Berkeley Psychic Institute, you got to look at all that and then begin to understand it to some extent in those terms. And as you begin to understand it, it gives you an opportunity to let go of you're not okay and begin to restructure yourself in a way that allows you to begin to find joy and happy and a sense of your own balance. So since so, you didn't necessarily find a community there, California, you know, as a, I guess a stereotype, but they, California as a state has a lot of people that are open and exploring. So there are so many different uh, groups or different modalities and communities. Did you, if you didn't find a home there, did you more so find other people where you spent more of your time? No, actually, in the context of the question, which is a really good question, I have never found community or home in the context mm-hmm. of the question. Mm-hmm. But to answer the question outside of that context of, com- of community with like-minded human beings, what I have come to understand on my journey is I understand home. And when I say home, I mean home. My relationship over the years, and we can back out of this in a minute, is with the Archangelics, the Lords of Light, the Ascended Masters. Many of these great beings, they are your home. They are your friends. You have access to them all the time. But most people are caught up in the humanness of the experience. They're very caught up in one thing that creates the biggest challenge to all humans And that's called time. And what I mean by that is we basically live in a linear time structure that we believe is all there is. This is it is. You don't challenge time. It's past, present, future, and you die. But what happens to the average person is they spend 99% of their time in the past or in the future. I hope this thing doesn't happen to me again in my future. Or they said, if I would do this, I would be successful in my future. So if you think about it, to a great extent, you're constantly looking back and forward. You spend very little time in present time where you get quiet, you can observe, and you can ask different questions. And you have the ability to choose differently. It's taken my entire life path to recognize what I've always known, which is when I get quiet in that space, I have this information, these answers, this communication readily available to me. It's never left me. I have left it, like all humans leave it, that space, that internal guidance system in the heart, that engagement with a higher level of consciousness, well-being, joy, happy bliss, all those wonderful words, also words like certain and capable and gracious, they all are who you are. But when we, as a little kid, turn off those abilities, and when we, as a little kid, move outward to get the truth from the world that tells me how to play the game, we get confused. In my space, I spend a lot of time confused and asking what's wrong with me, like most everybody else. But when it finally started to settle down, what I realized in my sleep space, I am very aware. In my sitting right here, I just ask a question and the communication conversation occurs. So by recognizing that my community was not the human dimension of people, I mean, I love people, it's fun, people are great, but it's not where my internal balance and well-being is. Does that make any sense? 
No, yeah. that makes perfect sense. It's actually a good segue for mastering alchemy because if you found a way to uh, master your truth, then you are providing a way for others to do as well. And that, that kind of leads into mastering alchemy. So if you can give us a brief overview and then we can dive in deep. Sure. But, you know, so, real quick, Jim, let me ask you this question. How long... In the process, from the time that you first started at BPI, you said you were there 14 years. Was it in that 14 years that you started to get an idea of like, you know what, I, I think I want to start to create my own space and go in this direction? When did that kind of start to come about? It, it started pretty much in the in the 90s, in the mm-hmm. late 90s. It began for me. The Berkeley Psychic Institute was not a job. It was an excitement. And the way it was structured, many people had very low having this, and they would go to work there. And the nature of how the management of the Berkeley Psych Institute at the time ran, it basically created slaves. So you do this, you do that, and we'll pay you if we get a chance to pay you. And So people were in a very low having this state. And they were not, they didn't have a sense of their own certainty. And so I watched all that and I was a successful business person at the time. And so I didn't get run by money and everybody else seemed to get run by money. And the people that played there, they were generally not, um, oh, I don't want to be rude. They were not generally high having this people nor did they have a lot of high motivation. And with that said, there were some really brilliant people that were there. But basically, it got to be a point where you you watch the nature of what you would like to have happen, and then you watch people not blowing their pictures in your in, you know, in the vernacular of Berkeley Psych Institute. They were not getting rid of what was keeping them from being capable or being successful or being certain or really defining themselves, even though the tools were taught, the rose as a, as a major tool was taught. What wasn't taught, and this I'll explain in Mastering Alchemy, was the words. And what I mean by that is, if I said to you, do you have, have you ever been certain? The general answer person gives you is, oh yeah, sure, I know what certainty is. Or I've been certain. Well, do you know what certainty is? Yes, I know what certainty is. Well, that's an intellectual, that's the rational mind telling you what a feeling is all about. And thinking feelings doesn't work. They're two different things. So if I said to you, though, take a breath, close your eyes, be right here in present time right now where we're talking, and would you feel certain? As soon as you change the direction from do you know to do you feel, The body sits up, you get more comfortable, you take a little deeper breath, there's a sensation in the body, and here I am. Uh, Yeah, I know what certain feels like. So what happens when, in, in the context of putting the rose at your edge of your aura, you can, mostly Berkeley Psychic Institute taught it as the protection rose. But you really don't need protection You just need a point of delineation that says from the rose to my heart is me and everything on the other side of the rose is Shakespeare's theater to entertain me. (laughs) Now think about it. That creates a very different perspective in how to begin to look at and experience yourself. Then if you start to play with words, again, this is the level one, level two body work of Mastering Alchemy. To some extent, it's much more involved. But think about it. If you could feel the word certain right now, and then if I said, well, just shift it a little bit, and would you feel capable? And then shift it again, and would you feel happy? And then go back to capable, go back to certain... And then create a triangle, let's call it a platform, of certain, happy, and capable. But you feel those words. In those words, are you a person with low havingness? Are you doubting? Are you self-judging? Or are you standing on a platform 
beginning to define yourself in a place of curiosity that has no punishment, it has a lot of permission, and it gives you a chance to experience yourself in a way that you've never been given permission or directed. And your rose is out there defining, this is me, and that's the theater to watch. Can you hear the difference in that person? Yeah. Absolutely. So, to answer your question about mastering alchemy, one of the things that happened in my engagement with a lot of these different beings, I began to realize this word channeling that everybody uses. Usually, there's a level of giving up your space. Mm -hmm. And in this case, what I was realizing is I was engaged with, not lesser than, the Archangelics, Yeshua, Mother Mary, all the Metatron, Melchizedek, do they have a better sense of information where they are much clearer than I am in my body? Oh, absolutely. But when we engage, we engage as if we're sitting at the table having a conversation, not as a better or lesser. And that understanding is really, really helpful to a person's spiritual growth. But in the context of mastering alchemy, Metatron and I were having a conversation and Metatron said, there is a pathway that has never ever been walked by humanity. And we believe that there's an opportunity for you as an individual and many other individuals to progress along this pathway of a journey into your own ascension, into your evolution. And simultaneously, in that space of your evolution and your ascension, the ability to hold the door open for the rest of humanity to step into a fifth dimensional space is very available. And simultaneously, as that consciousness gets understood, the opportunity to raise the earth back to its 12th dimensional, fully Christed state of consciousness will happen. Would you like to play? Well, what do you say to Metatron? Ah, look, I'll get back to you. <laughs> so mastering alchemy started, and it was on the foundation of all the tools, the rows, the grounding cord, the center of your head, it took you into the higher mind. It had a tremendous amount to do with stepping into a space called the sanctuary of the pink diamond within the sacred heart. It began to align vibrations like certain and capable with the ability to perceive from that higher mind. It began to present concepts differently than were really ever heard. One of the things that happens is you reconfigure the chakra system. They, the seven chakras stay right physically where they are, but they get realigned to be utilized in a very different way than we have typically known them. They open up into the upper seven chakras, which you begin to use more consciously. You begin to play with something, for example, called the Eye of Horus. Most people think it's a necklace or it's something in the mystery schools in Egypt. But in fact, it's, a, it's a, an alignment within the brain that when turned on, allows you to basically start to treat all of your psychic abilities as one clairsentience, telepathies, clairaudience, clairvoyance, transmediumship, you begin to act from a knowingness, a perception, an awareness that allows you to choose very differently. And that's really kind of level one and level two of a more progressive program that continues. So when you started the Mastering Alchemy, now I know you haven't mentioned this yet, I just happen to know, but when you started Avalon, is that what you were teaching and you just changed the name? Or? No. Oh, well, yes and no. So when, we left, when I left the Berkeley Psychic Institute, um, I was um, recently married at the time 
uh, to another member of the psychic community and uh, went up to Chico, California, in North Northern California, and started another institute. And that was actually part of the, when you look back at your your journey, that was really a key part of it. And we both really taught Berkeley Psychic Institute tools. And yet there began to be little pieces. It was not clear the Metatron conversations were not happening in the, as I just defined. But we began to recognize there was something that could be done differently. And, um, and that was in 94 through about 2000. And then uh, I got a divorce and moved up to Tahoe with another person who was part of the Avalon Institute, Roxanne Burnett, who uh, Roxanne and I have been together for now 18, 19 years, uh, teaching Mastering Alchemy. But it was a kind of a stepping stone that would be a better answer. Mm. Mm. And so how did you exactly come up with that name, Mastering Alchemy? Did they tell you, oh, this is a big name, or you just kind of decided on your own? Well, no, it was an interesting uh, interesting naming because one of the things that began to be clear is in the course of the conversations, there was a definition of alchemy. And alchemy is not so much changing lead to gold, which is the historical kind of interpretation of alchemy, um, which is very much part of this whole manifestation. But Metatron said one day, it's the, it's the um, changing of the frequencies of thought, altering the harmonics of matter, and applying the elements of love to create a desired result. And in simple terms, it, it was like, okay, well, whatever. You know, it's, it's like it wasn't grasped. And then we started playing. And so in the context of all changing the frequency of thought. So if you know what it feels like to be depressed, angry, resentful, you also know what it feels like to be happy, laughing, enjoying. Two very different densities, two very different sets of vibrations two very different thought configurations. One is heavy, static, and it's got a lot of... The other one is much more of a flowing, freely aligned vibrational field of flexibility. So as you begin to start to look at what I just said a little while ago, I could be really angry, but can I move my attention, my attention point to happy? as a feeling? Can I build a platform? Can I stay on my side of the rows? Can I observe the noise out there without going to out there? So frequency of thought, altering the harmonics of matter, a real simple part of the definition is thought has form, thought has density. Thoughts just don't go someplace when you get done thinking the thought you thought, they go somewhere. And so a lot of times when you get an emotion, I'm not okay, combined with a thought that says I'm not okay, it gets very heavy in the body, as we all know. Well, what if you could reconfigure the thought and the emotion in such a manner that you could change the density of the matter, of the thought form? That has a lot more to be discussed, but that's kind of the point. And then beginning to apply the elements of love, we know so little about this massive configuration of love. When you start to play in the sacred heart and you start to be able to recognize, I can change my thought, I can change my emotions, I can redirect my energy field, I can raise energy up, I can raise energy down, I can use my communication skills to alter the direction of a flow of events, then it gets really interesting. And when you can combine the, the power of love, it doesn't have a sword. There's no push or shove, but there is a power that allows you to reconfigure and move consciousness in different directions. 
that became the source of mastering alchemy. And it was Roxanne who came up with the thought, said, why don't we just call it mastering alchemy because this is where we're going to play and teach. So mm-hmm. hence the name. Mm-hmm. Wow, that was a lot. That was, a lot. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, very exciting. Co-creating for sure. <laughs> very exciting. Very exciting. <laughs> See, there's one more piece to this, and, and in a way, a question can come up, not a personal question to me, but why does anybody even care? Well, part of this right now, if you look at the world, the world is in a tremendous transition. And one of the things that we were told way back in 2003, which was a period where an extraordinary event occurred, but basically we were told in 2012, there is going to be a very significant shift that will come by. And so 2012, there was a significant shift. And the significant shift was effectively what you call an operating system in a computer, let's say, you know, a a Microsoft 7 or 10 or whatever it may be. Third dimension, fourth dimension, fifth dimension, in a way are boxes. And we live in the box and there are rules and structures to the box. And we play by the rules and the structures. And when you play by the rules and the structures, you don't get out of the box. But if you could understand the rules and the structures of what third dimension is, fourth dimension, fifth dimension, real simple, third dimension has good, bad, right, wrong, should, shouldn't, it has duality. There is nothing unconditional in the third dimension. It's all conditional and it's structured on linear time. When you begin to step into the fourth dimension, I'm really abbreviating, fourth dimension operates in present time, like right now where we're communicating. See, right now you're not thinking about breakfast this morning or what you're going to do in an hour from now. You're right here. When you get into that nature of present time, that's fourth dimensional. You play in third and fourth all the time simultaneously. But in fourth dimension, you have choice. In third dimension, you have reaction. Reaction meaning, oh my God, this wasn't supposed to happen. You are now in present time, third dimension, reactionary present time. Fourth dimension, you have choice. Would you like spaghetti or pizza? Uh, Let me think about it. Present time. But in fourth dimension, there's an odd word that comes into play that's called paradox. And what paradox means is really big helpful. What was true a moment ago may not be true right now. And what was false a moment ago may not be false. So when you live in the third dimension in words like always and never, she's never going to be honest. He's always going to be a bad person. There's not a lot of room, choice, to view your circumstance differently. Third dimension, they are always going to be a thief. There's no possibility they will ever change. And there you are locked into a story. If you step into fifth dimension, which is really astonishing, it's very much structured in words like well-being, co-creation, cooperation, beauty, gratitude, appreciation, dignity, integrity. Run out the whole list. That's the fifth dimension. Now, if you think about it in your life, how often do you walk around having a sense of beauty about yourself or enjoying beauty or being in alignment of integrity or feeling certain about yourself. So when you step into that platform, oddly enough, words like fear, safety, trust in a fifth dimensional space don't even exist. There's yeah. nothing unsafe. There's nothing to distrust. And you begin to play in this field of co-creation. All three states of consciousness are very available right now. So hence, in 2012, one of the things that takes a little more explanation is the third dimension, the door on the third dimension was closed. And Metatron said at 12, 12, 12, on that day, at that moment, there will never be another child born into the third dimension ever again. So what I mean by the door was closed is all the good, bad, right, wrong simply was not anchored into a foundation. 
But here, very rightfully, you could say, yeah, but Jim, look around, good, bad, right, wrong, greed, theft, domination, slavery, they're all really alive and well. This is where the shift happens between the third dimension and the fifth dimension. You believe all those things still exist, so they do. If you believe they do, they do. So, but if you can get into the fourth dimensional space in just simple terms, present time observing and allowing a truth to no longer be a truth or, a fail or a falseness, and you stay on your side of the rose, and you begin to watch the noise, the drama of the game, rather than putting your finger in that light socket, all of a sudden you find that a lot of the energy that you have held that's aligned with what's on the Shakespeare Theater begins to fall away. Now, I don't mean you run it through your emotional body and you go to therapy. I mean it simply short circuits because, remember I said at the beginning, Here's the truth for you, young man. You're not okay. You're stupid. You're not attractive. You're never going to succeed. And I accept that and then start asking myself, what did I do wrong? What am I going to do with myself if I'm not okay? <laughs> you see, it's impossible to be not okay. Impossible. But it is very possible to wear a shirt that's too small and shoes that don't fit and walk around unhappy believing I'm not okay. Not okay, yeah. So that third dimension changed in 2012. A new operating system was put into place. It took 12, 13, and 14 to kind of boot it up. But 15, 16, and 17, it is causing the transition from that third dimensional world of greed, selfishness, slavery, domination, etc. All that is coming to the surface it's being driven out of everybody on the planet. And so does it, if, if you can hear that, does it make any sense? You have a Donald Trump. You have a world in nationalism pushing against populism. You have people very much engaged in us and them and they're bad and we're good. And it's all coming to the surface to be released. Yeah, it makes total sense. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that actually goes back to a couple of weeks ago when we had the the solar eclipse and you did the channelers of change and you had partnered with uh, Steve Rother and another channel, I forget his name right now. Yeah, Jeff Hoppy. Um, Jeff Hoppy, thank you. And yes, totally enjoyed that, but it speaks to what you just discussed. And um, I, I guess the next question was, uh, and this is probably more so a third dimension question, but when you were getting those communications back in 2003, about 2012, then one would gather that in 2017, you're getting conversations about 2024 or 2025, or is that a non-issue now? Well, it's a little different. You see, basically where you are right now, you are the creator. And this is one of the things that the Archangelics have said from the beginning. We, the Archangelics, we know all of the possibilities and we know all of the probabilities. We know them. But you are the one with the body. And you kind of technically created the fall of consciousness, which is a wonderful story all by itself. And it's you as a human being that has to unravel these pieces. And so we will guide you, we will provide you information, and to a great extent, the, one of the main objectives of Mastering Alchemy has begun to basically create these vibrational fields of well-being and placing them into the ethers for humanity to see. And that's been very successful. And people all over the world are doing what they're doing, very spiritually aligned, playing out their one puzzle piece. And... That one puzzle piece is absolutely essential because the puzzle is not whole unless all the puzzle pieces get put in place. But the mastering alchemy piece is basically really placing a lot of these constructs of thought and frequency of matter uh, applied with the element love into the consciousness. And, um, and that's kind of where we've been playing and in addition to 
the individual's ability to step up into a fifth dimensional world. So what's, what happens in my awareness is, is what is it that I would like to see happen and then recognize this is a very big shift in, that is available to everybody but occurs where in Mastering Outcomes we focus on it, is most everybody's reality is to go away from themselves to get their well-being. I'm going to ask you, am I okay? Did I, did I give you a good talk today? Do you like me? Is my dress nice? Do I have the right clothes? Do I have the right job? Am I acceptable? That's what we basically do. We go to the world to validate us. But as you begin to build this platform and you start to disconnect, you still engage with the world, but you don't engage with the judgment, the opinion, the throwing energy, the putting your finger in every light socket of somebody else's constructed opinions. You allow them to go. You allow them to be okay and you're okay. You don't have to engage in everything. In that context, one of the most miraculous parts of everything that learned is everything comes to you. So when you stop moving away from yourself and you get quiet in present time and you get happy and you're pleased with yourself and you enjoy yourself and you even get to the point where you say, I kind of like myself, really a big deal. It's in, I like myself, I'm okay. That you start to have thoughts you know, I see, I think I'd like to go to the movies on Friday. And somebody shows up and says, hey, I've got two tickets to this movie Friday. You want to go? And it's a coincidence. And then it's another coincidence and another and another and another. And pretty soon you realize, if I just hold my attention on my thought without a lot of complication or need, everything comes to me. So in that context, now with thousands of people in the Mastering Alchemy Place, recognizing that I can sit and hold my attention on well-being, and it begins to permeate into the ethers, and it gets even more interesting from there. Wow. We need so much Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. I do all too well. You know, it's challenging. But see, one of the things that's really important to recognize right now that is helpful, I think, for people is as this operating system is shifting and as every single person is affected and you can't take your baggage with you on this journey, everybody's going into that fifth multidimensional state, but you can't take your I'm not okay with you. Mm. And so this begins to be a whole other component of Mastering Alchemy. But in that place of not taking your I'm not okay, you begin to get a different sense of yourself. And But what's happening to the average person is their status quo is being interrupted. It's like an earthquake. Hey, David, you've been through earthquakes. You are absolutely helpless. Yeah. in an earthquake nothing and it's an amazing feeling it's like whoa i have no control yeah and that's in fact what's happening to every person on the planet plus or minus and their status quo is no longer there their comfort level is not there their means of doing what they used to just take for granted they're not allowed to hide anymore they're not allowed to be dishonest anymore without getting kind of all over you and so all of that's coming to the surface as well as all of those hidden I'm not okay's that we don't like to look at all coming to the surface and so consequently the individual internal reflects the external and so you're watching the world unfolding but every single person on the planet is affected by this spiritual shift in consciousness. Mm. Um, I want to ask you a question. The Hamza kind of mentioned it, that um, that web thing you did with the two other guys, Steve and I don't know what the other guy's name was. Jeff Hoppy. Jeff Hoppy, okay. And I think Steve, Joanne, want, Joanne says hello, and then she wanted me to ask you this question. Um, Steve mentioned that on October 22nd, there was going to be a, a, a final wave or another wave that was going to hit, and she was just wondering how that manifested itself. Yeah. So back, back uh, now a year or some ago, 
three waves of light started to really penetrate the earth, penetrate you and me. Two of the waves were, um, I don't want to say destructive, but basically they created disconnects. And they were unraveling all of the status quo that I just talked about. The purpose wasn't malicious. The purpose was you can't take your baggage with you, so we're going to help you. And so these two waves came in. The third wave was a wave that basically allowed when you realized I'm okay and I can let this go, that third wave really helped smooth out those emotions, uh, those thought patterns, the, the confusion, and made it a lot simpler if people would kind of just allow what came up to go. Since then, last year and a half ago, there have been a couple more waves. So this wave in October is a wave that has an additional set of disconnects with it. And how it's playing out is it's forcing more of the things to the surface. It's forcing a lot of what you're seeing in terms of Trump events, with not beating Trump up or making him good or bad. His style is so disruptive and it's pushing people. You think about North Korea. You're pushing somebody to the edge of a nuclear war. That's you got big kahunas to basically stand up to that with it or a lot of stupidity, one or the other, and probably a little bit of both. But that wave is pushing some of these very big events into your face um, in a manner that something different has to be chosen. You can't stay in the status quo. You can't continue to be a racist, a sexist a person that tells you know bad jokes and then hides behind their you know their their demeanor. All of that is being pushed to the surface to get rid of because there's a lot more under the surface that has to come out, and you're going to see that a lot of that in the next year. With that being said, would you would you also say that it would take someone like a Trump from a spiritual level that, to exist? Because without that type of energy, he wouldn't be able to put, I mean, who else would be able to push everyone forward by forcing them to look at what they can bring along with them to the next density? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not a statement he's good or bad, up or down, but you have to have something that really interrupts your status quo. And if you look around the world, he's interrupted the status quo. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And it's going to be both messy and wonderful in the transition. And this transition is going to last for a number of years. And there's quite a few components that are going to come up and sneak up on people in ways that are not expected. So would you, with that statement, would you say that the past decade was messy, but while you were going through it, but hindsight made it very beautiful to bring us to where we are today? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what, with your, I want to give you some more time about the Mastering Alchemy with, I mean, it sounds prudent. Like, I mean, if there's no time, everyone's going to do it when they're supposed to. And, and, you, and you have a, a, enough people, or you have a lot of people that are continuing to, awaken and be aware of, of classes like Mastering Alchemy. But if I just heard of Mastering Alchemy today, what, it, what kind of timeline would I look at as far as being involved and being instrumental in the future? Well, let, let me tell you the beginning to the end. And the beginning is the ability to recognize yourself. And so that's what level one does, provide you a whole lot of tools and pieces of information, mostly things you've known about yourself forever that validate you. And then the level two body of work, which is nine months long, uh, level one is a $75 program, at least for another two weeks. It's a $125 program, 14 hours of me talking directly to you on video and giving you instruction about tools and some explanations, as well as five live events, uh, classes that um, everybody gets together and I basically teach these classes, level one. Level two is all uh, recorded and 
uh, and yet I do live classes and live questions. But level two is very much about recognizing that you are in the world, but not of the world. As I said, stay on your side of the rose, Shakespeare's theater, begin to think from the heart, the higher mind, not engage in everything that's noisy and fearful. And so you begin to turn a little bit and you recognize that there's the world and I don't like all of that. And many spiritual people grow up saying, I never fit, I don't belong, I don't know how to talk to these other people, uh, there's more to me than there is. That's the, that's the person that basically finds mastering alchemy to a great extent. And so you start to have structure to recognize, I can step out of the world, I can go to work, I can be married, but I'm not of that world. And then you begin to take another step as you go into level three, which is about three years of work, three consecutive years. And, um, and all of that is automated. Again, a lot of conversations and engagement with me. Every single class, it happens once a week, and every class has an additional recording. I said earlier, if I wanted to have a conversation with Metatron, I have it right now. It's always present in my space. What happens in the sleep space is another configuration in my reality. But in order to do Mastering Alchemy, we brought in another channel who was in agreement energetically to do this. And Metatron would talk through that channel and I would ask questions and we would have a dialogue about an hour, hour and a half in every class in level two and three, or most of level two and all of level three, you get that recording also, that conversation. And that's all about beginning to recognize I don't have to go to that world for my well-being. Everything comes to me. And then the next part of it is very much about creating the living light body. And this relates to changing the brain, playing in the upper seven chakras, beginning to alter the neuron messaging system from the brains to the cell, begin to engage with these beings, start to play in the eighth chakra, which is where the eighth, ninth, tenth chakra, the mind of creator. So it becomes a very spiritual journey, but it's very mechanical about being in a human body into that living light body. And when that gets engaged, then the ability to start to create your life very differently starts to become very clear to you. But it's a, it's a journey. It is not a hang out for two weekends and we'll give you a certificate to put on your wall. <laughs> Let me ask you about the sleep state. Are you, or probably not so much now, I wanted to get your opinion on, on the, uh, the, what do you call it, the alpha, the beta, the delta waves. Uh, there's some encouragement of listening to those while you sleep because you can, uh, you can absorb more in the subconscious state. What's your take on that? Um, you know, I played in and out of that all my life, and I think it has some value. You can also learn how to just basically get into those states by yourself. Um, so I, I think it has value for a lot of people. Um, it's not something that I think you can get there different ways. Uh, but but getting there with different ways requires a whole different level of uh, responsibility and maturity. Mm-hmm. It's not a place where you go be spiritual for an hour and then go to the bar and drink and cuss and throw rocks at people. It's <laughs> really a, a different a different <laughs> configuration of how you wish to live live your life. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask you that from a fourth and fifth dimension perspective. What is, what is a typical day like for Jim Self? I mean, on one hand, I'm, I'm thinking that you having this cup of coffee type communication, it would be hard to want to leave that. Well, why leave it? You know, I understand your question, but really my answer is why leave it? See, all of this is not about a meditation where you go close your eyes. It's about a living, walking around, engaging space. It's about standing in your job and seeing how people are thinking and basically looking for the way to structure a result. 
a desired result. It's the ability to have those that eye of Horus turned on in the center of the brain, engaging all your psychic abilities in a conversation and realizing that you can lay out a set of choices that everybody will agree to uh, in their own best interest. They agree to it, not in your interest, but that begins to be an easier, smoother course of events. So your ability to perceive and view from different points of reference without getting all wound up in your own ego or your own emotional issues begins to be something that works real well. So in that light body, for example, you, you start to see how do you construct the world you wish to have? How do you begin to draw using something we haven't even talked about, the rays of creation, these huge, powerful, energetic forms of creative energy to start to sculpt and create imaging that allows a different set of choices. There's a particular set of classes that I do where my, my example is the world is the people are in, you know, out in the cold, stormy ocean water, and you just basically start to hold the thought of a beach. And you basically create the beach and you create the warmness and you create the joy on the beach. And one by one, they begin to see the beach and they come one by one, 10 by 10, hundreds by hundreds. And pretty soon they're on the beach and they don't remember the storm or where they came from. And but at that time, somebody says, well, who did all this? And nobody knows. And (laughs) and you smile. Very, That's very what's nice. possible. That's what's possible. We we are at the top of the hour, and for selfish reasons, I want to hear more about Switzerland, but you have some upcoming conferences, but I, I'd be remiss if you didn't cover those during our talk today. Well, they're not available to the audience that's listening to this. The, the, see, ah. our purpose is very focused on providing a pathway for people to choose to one, know themselves and to simply rearrange the I'm not okay and then be able to hold these levels of light that bring about what you hope to have happen. They basically allow you to be the creator that you are. See, you're a creator being. Create. And, mm-hmm. and in that space... That's what Mastering Alchemy is all about. So these conferences, uh, and we do a lot of free things. That's a better question. We do free lectures every month. There is t- a lot of free information in the Mastering Alchemy library. Lots of instructional videos, lots of conversations. I've been doing more Facebook. On the 15th of um, November, I'm going to do a live Facebook conversation about artificial intelligence you know is it the terminator or is it the new construct of the brain for the new human Mm -hmm. it's it's a little bit of both but there is an opportunity to plant a seed here that this that particular talks all about so much free stuff masteringalchemy.com masteringalchemy.com and as you mentioned Facebook and we will definitely keep an eye out for November 15th I want to get your take on Facebook shutting down their AI a couple of months ago because it chose to start speaking on its own outside of our control and they shut that down but yeah, uh, we'll say that very so I mean and that's what they told us so did they really shut it down um, we definitely have to have you on again I mean I can't believe another hour has gone by uh, and again, thanks again, Jim. For uh, Jim, you can check him out at MasteringAlchemy.com. He has a, his Facebook page as well. You can see all that that he talked about with his uh, free classes and such. And sign up for level one, two, and three, and you'll get to play with us. So with that, this is Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I'm David. And thanks again for your time, Jim. We appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Very much blessings, guys. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Thanks very much. Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast. Please check us out on our website at intrinsicmotivation.life where you can click on the speak pipe button and leave any suggestions for a future podcast that you'd like us to cover. 
Also check us out on our social media sites. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook page, iTunes podcast, in addition to Stitcher and Google Play, all under intrinsic motivation from a homie's perspective. Check you out next time. Have a great day.